Who says war doesn't have a woman's face? Healthy, muscular men with huge swords are the hallmark of combat fantasy. But women always stand shoulder to shoulder with this mountain of meat and iron. Female warriors combining femininity and strength are usually shy. Men avoid showing interest in the aggressive woman with a sword, considering it a manifestation of their own weakness. Ladies squint with apprehension at those who have exchanged their mop for a spear and now deftly slice open their belly rather than faint at the sight of a dragon. Most artists paint fantasy women with swords in exactly the same way, depicting them as muscular, half-naked, and standing in the most frank poses. In fact, that's how most of us pictured Amazon women. We all know who they are, but only in general terms and without details. And yet, the legends of the Amazons have a lot of little-known and fascinating details. Speaking of Amazons nowadays, we mean either semi-wild and dressed in the most depraved way representatives of the weak sex with developed muscles and weapons in their hands, or, in a modern context, simply independent and free women. Where did this word come from in our language? The concept of Amazon could theoretically be derived from the Iranian Hamazon, warriors. If in the similar-sounding Greek phrase amazos the particle aid is considered an intensifier then this phrase would be roughly translated as full-chested. A very common version is that the word Amazons is derived from the Greek amazos with the negative particle ad that it is without breasts. It is believed that the Amazons cut off their right breasts or even burn them out so that they could shoot their bows more freely. In fact, this is a myth. In ancient paintings, Amazons were always depicted with a pair of breasts. Sometimes one of them was covered by clothing. There are many other variants of the origin of the word Amazons. For example, a masso, from masso, to touch, to touch, could mean not touching to men. By the way, the North Caucasian languages has survived the word maza, moon, which may be an echo of the distant time, when the inhabitants of this region deified the moon, the goddess of hunting, corresponding to the Greek Artemis. By the way, the consonants of the warriors with the Amazon River in South America is not accidental, only that the river was named after them. The Amazon was discovered by the conquistador Francisco de Orellana. He was also the first European to cross South America in its widest part. In the summer of 1542, a detachment of pioneers allegedly saw the legendary Amazons, with whom they engaged in battle. Today it is believed that they were either Native American women fighting alongside the men, or simply long-haired Indians whom the Spaniards mistook for women. Originally, D. Orellano wanted to name the river after himself, but after the skirmish, he settled on the Amazon option. For the ancient Greeks, the Amazons were no less real than any other inhabitants of the northern lands. Sources of those times contain a lot of information about Amazons, of course, most of them fictional. Some of them state that the Amazons allegedly lived on the coast of the Euxine Pontus, Black Sea, in her own state, ruled by Queen Hippolyta. The latter entered the legends thanks to Hercules. It was from her that he had to steal the magic belt while performing the night feat. Herodotus in his history reports that the capital of the Amazons was called Themyscira, and it stood on the banks of the river Thamodon, south of the Black Sea, modern Turkey. There is a version according to which the Amazons came to Greece from Lake Meotia, that is, from the Sea of Azov. From there they made military campaigns throughout Asia Minor, even reaching Syria and Egypt. According to legends, the Amazons founded cities such as Ephesus, Smyrna, now Turkish Izmir, Sinop, and Paphos. Diodorus of Sicily believed that the Amazons lived on the river Tanais, modern dawn. It was so named in honor of the Amazon's son, Lysiba, who fell in love with his mother and threw himself into the river in order to avoid the criminal incest. All legends agree that the society of the Amazons was ethnos gynaikokratumen oil, a nation where women rule and where there is no place for men. Famous Greek geographer Strabo wrote that once a year Amazons would make a raid on the Caucasian tribe Gargarians ancestors of the Ingush and Chechens, with a very specific purpose, to have children by them. The boys who were born of such an alliance were returned to their fathers at best or killed. The girls were taught to work in the fields, to hunt, and to fight. Thus, new members of the tribe of warlike women were born. From all of the above, we can conclude that blonde Amazons were invented by artists. Considering the ways of extending their lineage, ancient warriors in their classical sense must have had a typically oriental appearance. Amazons appear in many overtly male legends. According to legend, they successfully fought against Phrygia and Libya, 
and also attacked Lycia, but were defeated by the ancient Greek hero Bellerophon, the tamer of the legendary Pegasus. The young hero was sent by the Lycian king Ibit to fight the Amazons, secretly hoping that Bellerophon would be killed. However, the treacherous ruler's plans were not destined to come true. The Amazons also took part in the Trojan War and on the side of Troy. Legend has it that Hippolyta, ruler of the Amazons, was once hunted and accidentally killed by her sister Penthesilia. Tormented by remorse, the new ruler decided to end her life, as befits a true Amazon, that is, in battle. Her attack against the Greeks was initially successful, but Achilles intervened, knocking Penthesilia off her horse and piercing her with his spear. The military might of the Amazon state was so great that they easily laid siege to Athens, and even broke into the city itself when Theseus, who ruled there, kidnapped their queen Antiopa, or rather, he got her as a trophy during Heracles' campaign for the belt of Hippolyta. However, after a while Antiopa fell in love with Theseus and was absolutely unwilling to return to her native land. During the battle, Antipope fought at the side of her beloved and was accidentally killed by her fellow tribesmen, after which the conflict between the Amazons and the Athenians faded away. The battle between the Athenians and the Amazons gave birth to a separate genre of ancient Greek art, the so-called Amazonomachy, in the tradition of depicting the warlike Amazons on the battlefield, drawings on terracotta, marble carvings. With the passage of time, the references to Amazons became less and less. During the life of Alexander the Great there was a legend about the queen of Amazons, Talistris, who once came to the camp of the great general with 300 women from his tribe. Allegedly, Telestris wanted to offer all this considerable harem to Alexander in order to get from the eminent ruler as many offspring girls as possible, as strong and clever as their father. The Roman general Gnaeus Pompey wrote about Amazons who fought in enemy armies, and Virgil in his poem Aeneid clearly copied Camilla, a female warrior from the ancient Amazons. Wolski is the people who oppose Rome. The main weapon of the Amazons was considered Sagaris, the Scythian name of the double-bladed axe known to the Greeks as Polectus or Labras. The latter was widespread on the island of Crete as early as the Bronze Age, 3rd millennium BC, symbolizing femininity. In addition to the battle axe, Amazons actively used bows with arrows and small spears, a typical Scythian set. They seldom fought on foot. Their army was led by cavalry, which is also suggestive of the Scythian tribes. The Golden Labres, the symbol of the Minoan culture, the island of Crete, 2nd millennium BC. Where did the legends of the Amazons come from? What is it? A vague recollection of the archaic times when people lived under the matriarchy, or actually existed female peoples of the ancient era. Many theories have been put forward on this point. The Amazons were called daughters of Ares and servants of Artemis which suggests that a closed community of temple maids could be their prototype. In this context, the mythical cauterization of breasts can be interpreted as ritual mutilation. In the earliest examples of Greek painting, the Amazons wore a helmet and long tunics, bearing a resemblance to the warlike goddess Athena. Later, their clothing became more refined and lighter, highly girded, to make running easier, that is, copying the style of the goddess of the hunt Artemis. The Greek origin of the Amazons is confirmed by the fact that in battle they usually used a small shield peltis, which had the shape of a crescent. The latest images of Amazons show them dressed in the Persian manner, tight-fitting trousers and a high-pointed headdress, Kiteris. Mythical stories about the Amazons link them directly to two heroes, Hercules and Theseus. Since the latter often dealt with fictional creatures, by analogy we can assume that the Amazons were also a figment of fantasy. It is likely that they symbolize the dangers that the Greek colonists had to face on the Black Sea coast, given the alleged homeland of the Amazons, the Don Steppes, and the coast of the Sea of Azov. The Asian theory of their origin looks the most likely. The Greeks, settling in the Black Sea region, constantly faced with militant and semi-wild nomads. Herodotus directly stated that the Sarmatians were descendants of the Amazons and Scythians. Until recently, it was limited to that. Scientists considered the Amazons an artistic fiction emphasizing the uniqueness of the steppe barbarians in the eyes of the Greeks. However, at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st centuries, the situation changed. First, large women's burials were found in the north of Turkey in Samson province, and then in Taman, Cuban archaeologists dug up the graves of an entire tribe. Only women were buried there. Incredibly, 
but it's a fact that next to their bodies were found weapons, bows, quivers, and daggers, and an arrowhead stuck in the skull of one of the deceased. These findings prove that the northern Black Sea coast was inhabited, if not completely female tribes, at least, that they preserved the ancient ways of life, when the leading role in the society was played by woman. However, it is unlikely that these Amazons form the kind of closed communities of which the Greeks speak. The brutality towards men must also have been exaggerated. It is typical for people of different cultural types to create such legends about a land where life is radically different from their own. Either way, these tribal alliances were few and unstable. The old traditions of matriarchy, miraculously preserved until the new era, could not resist the campaigns of Alexander the Great, the mixing of cultures and the great migrations of peoples in the 4th, 7th centuries. It was then that the Amazons, a unique mixture of half-truth and half-fiction, ceased to exist. Ironically, warlike women have been in high demand at all times and on all continents. For example, King Chandragupta Maurya, 322-328 BC, who first unified part of India into a centralized state, had a very unusual guard, a Greek female giant. Almost 2,000 years later, the rulers of divided Indian states, such as the Nizams, kings of Hyderabad, resorted to a similar practice. It is known that the royal family of Kandy in Sri Lanka was guarded by a small army of female archers. In Europe, women from Celtic and Germanic tribes often fought alongside their husbands. The Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus says that there were more women than men in the army of Boudicca, the legendary Iceni queen who raised Britain in rebellion against the Romans in 60 BC. In the Scandinavian countries, there was an interesting custom whereby a woman unburdened by her family could take up arms and become a Stalmo, maiden with a shield. The saga of Hervora tells the story of one such girl, who dressed as a man and fought under the male name of Trevard. Trevora practiced necromancy and raised her dead father from the mound to give her the magical sword turfing. Remarkably, the dwarves who made this weapon put a curse on it. Every use of it will lead to the death of at least one person, and in due time this sword will cause three great misfortunes. Danish historian Saxon Grammaticus wrote that in the Battle of Braveler about 750 years, between the Swedish King Sigurd Ring and the Danish King Harald Gildetand, on the side of the latter, fought about 300 virgins with a shield. Saxon especially specifies that their shields were small and their swords long. Armed women who kept their gender a secret from others, frequent characters of the European epic of chivalry. The most famous female knight is Bradamant, sister of the famous knight Renaud de Montauban. Her adventures became part of two of the most important poems of the Italian Renaissance, Count Matteo Maria Boyardo's Orlando in Love, 1495, and its sequel, Ludovico Ariosto's Orlando the Furious, 1516. It is believed that it is from these stories that all modern fantasy grows legs. King Alo Chubbaja, the third ruler of Dahomey, modern-day Benin, Africa, from 1645 to 1685 and his son Dasu Agaja, who ruled from 1708 to 1732, created a powerful army with which they were able to conquer neighboring kingdoms and form a major state that lasted until the 19th century. The core of Dahomey's armed forces were well-trained royal bodyguards recruited from women. Their number gradually increased and by the beginning of the 19th century amounted to one-third of the army, about 6,000 men. The Dahomey Amazons, as Europeans nicknamed them, were the military elite, the most powerful military formation in all of Africa. Active in the slave trade, the Dahomey had an astronomical annual income of a quarter of a million pounds. Some of this money went to the war effort. In particular, the Dahomey Amazons were armed with incredibly expensive English rifles. The Amazons underwent special training and wore their own uniforms. They were forbidden to marry or have children. Many were virgins. Their army had a complex structure and was divided into ranks, and its discipline bordered on brutality. In 1890, after long and bloody battles, the French Foreign Legion conquered Dahomey, and the army of Amazons was disbanded. The last of them died in 1979.
During one of his voyages, Christopher Columbus learned from the Indians about islands inhabited only by women. He wanted to catch some to show them to the Spanish queen. But the venture failed. When Columbus's sailors tried to disembark, they were met by a mob of furious furies, adorned with feathers and armed with bows. The Europeans retreated, and the famous discoverer decided to call these islands the Virgin Islands, that is, Islands of Virgins. In the Atsaic century, the Frenchman Jules Crevaux, discovered in the Amazon jungle village, where only women lived. However, they turned out to be wives rejected by their husbands. According to the custom of those tribes, these poor people were put in the same village. During the reign of Emperor Nero, one of the constant entertainments of the Romans was the fighting of female gladiators. If we believe Tacitus, even noble ladies entered the arena. Despite the superstition about the woman on the ship, in the 18th and 19th centuries, wives often set sail with their husbands on British and French warships. During battle, they carried gunpowder to the cannons, put out fires, and helped the doctors. Until the beginning of the 20th century, Amazons appeared in literature only as specific opponents of the male protagonists. The latter had to defeat or in some way humiliate them, thus proving the superiority of masculinity over militant femininity. In 20th century fantasy literature, the Amazons gradually became more and more sympathetic. Today they are usually portrayed as beautiful and strong female warriors living in isolated communities. New Age Amazons challenge men only to later become their allies in some common cause. The process of softening the Amazon image is quite logical. After all, if we face it, it is not nature that creates angry, aggressive, and withdrawn women, but we men do. We should never forget that justice is a woman with a sword.